Hello and welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be discussing what role and impact the media has on shaping public opinion and attitudes towards Israel and in particular uh, Israel's recent conflict against Hamas in Gaza. We'll also be uh, discussing how Israel faces uh, a media war and how in that media war there's a real battle for truth and we'll be asking how Israel can actually convey her message and actually win this very important war uh, in terms of uh, truth and public opinion and in today's program I'm joined by Simon Polska who's the managing editor of Honest Reporting. Simon it's good to have you uh, back on the Middle East Report and it's our first program with our new set here in London. Nice to be back Simon. That's good. Um, Simon can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background um, what led you to really get involved in uh, fighting misinformation misreporting regarding Israel and what led you to work for Honest Reporting in Jerusalem? Well, I was a student activist many, many years ago, um, and of course a lot of uh, anti-Israel activity takes place on campuses, not just in Britain but around the world. Uh, so I had a background there, and I found my way working for the Board of Deputies of British Jews, which is the umbrella organisation, representative organisation of British Jewry. And I was in the Public Affairs Department, and this was around 2000, uh, the year 2000, the outbreak of the so-called Second Intifada, uh, the terrorist violence that... Uh, that was unleashed against Israeli civilians. And at the very same time, the media in Britain was, uh, it was absolutely uh, appalling towards Israel. And I used to take a lot of phone calls from irate members of the public. You know, what are you gonna do about you know, the BBC? What are you gonna do about the Guardian, et cetera, et cetera. And it took me a while, but I realized the, that they were asking the wrong question because the question really should have been, what can we do about the, the media here? And I took that with me and I moved to Israel uh, in the year 2001. And uh, eventually in the year 2005, after working for a number of nonprofits, um, I was hired by Honest Reporting to be their managing editor. And Honest Reporting's entire ethos is really based about what the ordinary person, the ordinary member of the public can do to defend Israel against media bias. And, and can you tell us something about uh, why Honest Reporting was set up and the very important work being carried out by uh, Honest Reporting? Well, Honest Reporting was actually set up um, in the year 2000, uh, 2001, I think. But uh, a couple of students, actually, in a, in a flat, an apartment in Golders Green, northwest London, a couple of Jewish students, they were really, really fed up uh, with the, uh, the media coverage of Israel. And they got together an email list where they basically just started sending out alerts to their friends, telling them to respond to media bias. And this was in the days when email was a, you know, maybe a sophisticated medium of communication, not, not, not so much now. But then, of course, uh, it really was the best way to do this online. Um, they, they grew the list, and eventually it grew so big that they actually had to hand it off to a Jewish outreach organization which seeded it and let it grow to become its own independent organization with charitable status in America and Israel, independent of the Israeli government, editorially independent, um, based on donations from ordinary people and advertising. And Honest Reporting has now grown uh, over the last, uh, over a decade now, we have some 150,000 subscribers worldwide, and uh, you know it's a very uh, uh, successful operation, uh, the largest grassroots uh, organization dealing with anti-Israel media bias today. And what's been response from some of the uh, mainstream uh, media? Uh, I know that uh, from going through your website, you've, you've put a lot of spotlight on the BBC, on CNN, on, on Reuters, uh, The Independent, and, and others. What has been response from these uh, media corporations? Well, I'm quite sure that quite a lot of them don't like us. And you know what? I don't care. Because if they don't like me, it means I'm doing my job. It means I'm holding them to account. And I hear anecdotally that whilst a lot of them don't like us, they at least respect us. And it keeps them on their toes. And it means they're not going to get away uh, scot-free with publishing anti-Israel uh, stuff, um, things that are inaccurate, uh, demonizing Israel, 
Um, and we certainly we, we play a very, very key role in, in educating the public as well to hold these media organisations to account. Excellent. Now, it's been over three months since uh, Israel launched um, Operation uh, Pillar of Defence, uh, in which Israel responded to the thousands of uh, rockets and missiles being fired upon southern Israel, which really affected up to about 1.5 million uh, Israelis living in southern Israel. Um, looking back at that conflict now, how do you see that that, was, that conflict was seen through the prism of the world's media? I think we perhaps reached a turning point. I don't believe that, uh, that the media is suddenly going to become best friends with Israel. That's not going to happen. But in terms of how Israel was able to portray her own battle, I think it was very, very much an improvement uh, over previous operations um, very much so. I think uh, what made a very big difference was preparation. I think we learnt a lot from previous operations such as Cast Lead, uh, the back end of 2009. And this time round, I do remember that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, he sat down the diplomats, the ambassadors from Western countries, and told them about the situation that was pretty much unbearable for the south of Israel. We had hundreds of Hamas rockets flying over from Gaza, uh, making life unbearable for our, our citizens. And this couldn't continue. And I do believe that when the operation was launched, it made a big difference to have the leaders of Western nations coming out publicly and saying, Israel has the right to defend itself. And from there, of course, it sets the tone for how the media was reporting as well. Um, so, of course, preparation was very much key. Uh, also, I think that was key was this was possibly the first conflict in the world that has also been fought on social media, almost in real time. We had the IDF um, using sophisticated means on Facebook, YouTube, um, Twitter. In fact, the start of the operation where um, the arch-terrorist Ahmed Jabari was, uh, was uh, the victim of a targeted killing, um, this was actually announced on Twitter, al almost live, within minutes of it happening. And from then on, the IDF managed to fill, fill the vacuum, if, it, if uh, you want to put it that way, with information in real time, which made a big difference because it meant that the other side was unable to fill those airwaves with their own misinformation. And uh, let's uh, remind ourselves of that uh, conflict that uh, occurred over three months ago, which was a very, very tense time in Israel, as Israel responded from, from the barrage of rockets and missiles being fired upon southern Israel from the uh, terrorist organisation Hamas based in Gaza. The Israeli military rushed a fifth Iron Dome anti-missile battery into service on Saturday and deployed it in the Tel Aviv area after Hamas militants in Gaza fired multiple rockets at the financial capital. The Iron Dome missile defense shield wasn't scheduled to come into service until early 2013, but because Tel Aviv was targeted with long-range rockets for the first time last week by Gaza militants, the army fast-tracked its deployment. The Israeli military has reported it shot down more than 240 incoming rockets, more than half the number of projectiles launched into Israel since this latest attack started, with Iron Dome scoring a 90% success rate of rockets it has been launched at. Israel's Minister of Civil Defence, Avi Dichter, and Mayor Ron Holdai have visited a so-called Situation Room in Tel Aviv, designed as a base to monitor the situation in Israel's largest city and stress the importance of the missile defence system. Here it happened from time to time in Tel Aviv. We have faced two rockets. Both didn't hit inside the city. So there is a probability, a slight probability, that it will hit inside Tel Aviv. The Iron Dome... Uh, brings down this probability to uh, a very small probability. But, you know, you cannot play games even if it's a, a very small, a very poor probability. You have to be in the shelter. Iron Dome has been operational since 2011, with currently five batteries deployed in Israel, most near the Gaza Strip. Each interception missile costs around 40,000 US dollars, with the US providing 200 million US dollars in 2010 to expand development. The system's allowing Israeli citizens to go about their lives with a degree of normality. And the life in Tel Aviv goes on. You go in the street, everything is as usual. Thank you. 
After they deployed the battery here, it feels much more comfortable, even though we hope that the rockets will not get all the way to us. But it feels much healthier and more comfortable to know that you have this kind of umbrella, such as the Iron Dome. Israel's been bombarded by hundreds of rockets since it launched Operation Pillar of Defense on Wednesday to crush Hamas's rocket launching capability. The Iron Dome missile defense shield is one of the tools Israel has to stop Gaza rockets from landing on Israelis. Police report. We saw in that clip uh, what Israel had to endure uh, those uh, three months ago in uh, Israel's war against uh, Hamas. Uh, uh, Simon, uh, what do you believe are the challenges and difficulties that Israel faces when she launches such a military operation against Hamas as we saw with um, Operation Pillar of Defense, knowing that Israel is under the full microscope of the uh, world's media? Well, I think the first thing to say is uh, we're dealing with a form of asymmetric warfare. And uh, Hamas and other uh, Palestinian terrorist organizations operate from within civilian areas, which means, of course, that you, know, you can't just roll in the tanks. Um, you can't just uh, launch uh, indiscriminate bombing. Um, Israel does not target civilians, full stop. Um, obviously, one of the challenges is to make sure that the amount of civilian casualties is as low as possible. Obviously, the other side doesn't care. The more civilian casualties on the Israeli side, the more that Hamas would be celebrating. Uh, Israel doesn't operate that way, of course. Um, so we have that problem there. Um, of course, the other, the other issue is that uh, the other side, the Palestinian side, is very, very good at using the media to portray um, Israel as an aggressor. So, for example, you see uh, the photos, the pictures, the images coming out of Gaza, people being uh, in, led into hospital, buildings being uh, blown up. You know, it's not pleasant. War is not a pleasant thing. The images are very, very disturbing. Um, of course, on the other side, if you're looking for, um, you know, who, who is the victim in all this? Well, of course, Israel is a victim of uh, hundreds and hundreds of rockets, but Thankfully, Israel is much better prepared for these things. Uh, our civilians uh, will go into bomb shelters, uh, sealed rooms. Um, we have uh, warning siren systems. But uh, you know, I think as well, it's uh, very, very difficult for people to imagine what it's all about unless they've seen it. I actually took a trip to Sterot, which is just outside the Gaza border. I went on an organized trip with a number of uh, foreign journalists, and we actually went to the the landing site of a Hamas rocket. Uh, it landed in the middle of a street in a, in a residential neighborhood. There was a crate on the floor, windows blown out, and uh, you know, quite surreal almost. Uh, an eight-year-old Israeli boy uh, walking around with the back end of a rocket, you know, very proud that he's, he'd uh, picked up this rocket. Uh, so, you know, the press are taking photos of all this. And then all of a sudden, uh, the alert goes off. And in Sterot, you have 15 seconds to take cover. That's not a lot of time. And literally, everyone scattered. We ran into the nearest house, the nearest apartment building that had actually already been damaged by the previous rocket launch. And I find myself uh, with a bunch of journalists running through someone's living room and into the sealed room, which is uh, a kid's bedroom. And it's like, all these journalists are crammed into the room. And it's, uh, you know, whose room is this? You know, one, one Israeli child sort of puts their hand up. You know, it's, it's my room. You know, it's like, oh, thank you very much. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, so, you know, it does make a difference, I think, for the yeah. journalists to, uh, to know what's going on. Um, I think another thing in the past that's happened is that Israel has not allowed the journalists uh, free access into Gaza, not because they wanted to cover up things, but because for their own safety, for operational concerns, Israel does not want to accidentally kill journalists who happen to be running around looking for a story. Um, last time in Operation Cast Lead in 2009, the journalists actually sat on a hill in Sterot overlooking Gaza, um, you know, tapping their heels and getting more and more irate. This time, Israel, I think, rightly let the journalists in. And this meant that the film footage coming out of Gaza was not from Palestinian stringers and it wasn't from Al Jazeera. And I think we got a much more accurate representation of what was actually going on on the ground. So, so going back to the uh, interesting story you had there with the uh, foreign journalists in the uh safe bedroom, as it were, in Starot with uh, so many foreign journalists. Um, could they then emphasize more 
with the uh, residents of uh, Sturrot, with what they have to go through in terms of the rockets and missiles that fall on that town? Well, I think it would be particularly strange if they weren't able to uh, at least uh, empathise with uh, the residents there, you know, having been caught in a rocket attack themselves. Um, of course, it goes the other way as well. You know, journalists who are perhaps running around Gaza and seeing scenes of destruction there will, of course, also feel something for the civilian population. And equally, Israelis also feel for the civilian population of Gaza because they are also victims of a Hamas leadership that really doesn't care about, ta about their own people. Yeah. But if we, if we look back at um, Operation uh, Defensive Pillar now, uh, when Israel launched that operation, it became an international news story. All the journalists around the world followed that story. But if we compare that to what's happening in, uh, uh, with one of Israel's neighbours, which is Syria, in which the UN have estimated there's been 70,000 people killed in that conflict so, so far, there's been very, very little uh, news coverage. Why is it that Israel appears to be more of a focus of news attention rather than our Arab neighbours? Well, I think there is for sure a double standard going on here. Um, however, it's not really that simple because um, there's a lot of question about access. Uh, journalists, um, obviously, a lot of their Middle East bureaus are based in Jerusalem. Why? Because Israel is a free country where journalists can write what they want, they can travel wherever they want. Now, if a journalist is in Syria or um, other neighboring countries, then perhaps they would have a, a, a minder with them from the government. They're not free to report what's going on there. And that's, that's in normal times when we don't have a, a civil war going on in Syria, for example. And of course, uh, a journalist who wants to keep their access is not going to write a particularly bad piece about uh, the government of that, that country because the next time they want a visa to get in there, they're not going to get that visa, at which point being the head of the Middle East Bureau is um, well, it's kind of irrelevant if you can't actually travel to a number of Middle East countries. So journalists are very, very careful about how they report other countries. I also think that there's actually a form of inverse racism going on here, that uh, Arabs killing Arabs is almost expected. So when you see you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds or thousands even of Syrians dying in a civil war there, uh, victims of a brutal regime, People just see it as uh, they don't relate to it and they think that's what goes on in the Middle East. But of course, uh, you get one Palestinian prisoner uh, dying in, a, in an Israeli prison and all hell breaks loose in the media. Now, I'm not saying that Israel is perfect, but um, you know, at, least, at least judge Israel by the sort of uh, standards that you would expect of any other Western country. Um, having said that, I don't want to be compared to a regime next door like Syria or Saudi Arabia uh, or other Arab states or Iran um, because uh, Israel is better than that. However, we should be judged by, uh, by the same standards as any other Western liberal democracy. I, I mean, I, I came back from uh, Brussels yesterday. I filmed my programme, the uh, European Report in the uh, European Parliament. So I took the Eurostar, came back, was on the underground. So when I was at uh, St Pancras Station, I picked up the uh, Evening Standard. And I was just going through the paper. I usually go for, to relax, go to the sports pages first, um, particularly like you probably as well, interested in the football. But just look through some of the uh, news stories. And then I found a very interesting story that was almost in the middle towards the end of the newspaper, um, a story about how the Syrian uh, military fired ballistic missiles and killed over 141 people yesterday, including 71 children, as was according to the Human Rights Watch. And yet you compare this coverage uh, of what's happening in Syria to what happens when Israel confronts uh, uh, Hamas in Gaza, for example, it'd be on the front page. So why is it we're seeing such um, a disproportion of news coverage condemning Israel, and yet there's a virtually silence by the international community and the world's media about what's happening in Syria, which is horrific. You're right. I mean, I have to ask the question, where is the outrage? Because it is outrageous what's going on in Syria. Um, you know, people are dying in their hundreds each day, and the international community is doing very, very little. And at the same time, you still have the media concentrating a lot of its focus on what goes on in Israel. Um, Israel is constantly uh, being criticised for anything that it does in the self-defence of its own people, because that really is what it's about. Um, obviously, you know, it's perfectly legit legitimate to criticise Israel in terms of for government policies that you may disagree with. That's perfectly fair. Um, 
but at least don't don't go beyond legitimate criticism into areas of demonization and perhaps even anti-Semitism. Um, I believe that uh, you know if, if Syria really should be treated as uh, you know a, an outrage that's going what's going on there now. Mm. Uh, and going back to uh, some of our international media corporations, um, Simon, why do so many of them fall for the lies, uh, the misinformation, and even the uh, stage management of some of their productions just in order to convey misinformation and lies to the uh, mainstream media? I think a lot of the a lot of the journalists you know, turn up in Israel or report on Israel with very preconceived uh, notions. A lot of prejudice there. Um, so it fits a story. The story for the media is a very black and white one, a David and Goliath story, where in this particular case, Israel is portrayed as the Goliath and the Palestinians as the uh, little David. Um, so it's, uh, you know, it's a very difficult situation. I also think that the, the messaging that comes out of Israel is not necessarily that clear. Of course, it's very difficult to explain 4,000 years of Jewish history in the land. Um, it's much easier for Palestinians to come out with one particular message that resonates, for example. How many times have you seen Palestinian spokespeople go on television and say it's all about settlements, it's all about occupation? It's a very, very simple thing to do. Um, of course, the situation is much more complicated than that. And it, a lot of the time, the media tend to ignore Jewish rights in the region. Um, all I have to do really is start digging with my hands in the earth somewhere in Israel, and I will dig up the, uh, the remnants of my ancestors from the last couple of thousand years. It's uh, an amazing place. Um, I'm not saying that, of course, Palestinians don't have rights. Palestinians, of course, do have rights. But it's, uh, you know, it's not a very, very simple story that can be portrayed in a couple of uh, you know, hundred words on an article or even 140 characters in a tweet, for, for example. Yeah, we've got this clip to go to now that uh, really does look at how some instances that are covered by our mainstream media have actually been stage managed. And we've got this clip now. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. We've got another clip to go to, which we're going to go to very shortly, Simon, which shows um, BBC hostility. Now, I, I know that uh, for many Israeli spokesmen, when they go either on BBC or they go on Sky or on particular the BBC, they get a very tough time. But the BBC seems to take a very hostile stance um, towards Israel in, in their reporting. Um, why do you feel this is the case? Um, I think there's a, a built-in structural bias within the BBC. It's not just about Israel. It manifests itself politically. Um, even I think a lot of BBC journalists would say that, uh, that there is a, a left-wing liberal slant in a lot of their reporting. Um, a lot of their particular employees come from a certain background. Um, and it means that it's very almost monolithic in that sense. Of course, that, again, is very simple to say because the BBC is a huge organisation with many, many employees. Uh, but certainly, we've definitely had problems with the BBC newsroom, uh, very much so. And we've got this uh, clip to go to now that uh, just shows you some of the hostility that Israel faces from uh, many who are reporters and journalists who are working for the BBC. I believe that Ban Ki-moon and Hillary Clinton wouldn't be coming here if not to close a deal. Uh, Netanyahu has been working on it with the Egyptians for a few days now. The Egyptians seem willing to play a role in Gaza in making sure that there wouldn't be rocket fire upon Israeli civilians. Israel can't trust uh, Hamas to guarantee that, but it can trust Egypt, which has a lot to lose from the United States if they don't succeed. And so that brings in an element that there wasn't before that could allow Netanyahu uh, to declare victory to the people of Israel. But what will this have achieved? And what, once we get a ceasefire, as clearly everyone hopes we will, what, what will it have achieved for Israel? 
Well, the whole goal was to achieve quiet in the South. You know, Israelis have been running for their lives there for 10 years. If that can stop even for a few months, uh, then that is a big achievement. And uh, having Egypt involved, which means having America involved, that's a guarantee that, that there never was before. If you can have somebody responsible, not a terrorist organization, who's there making sure that the people of Gaza are helped. Remember the whole goal here for Israel, we want the people of Gaza to be helped and not to suffer under the terrorist leadership that they have there. Uh, then, then that's good for Israel and that's good for the Palestinians. And uh, so th hopefully that can happen by the end okay. of the day. You, you, you say Israelis have been running for their lives uh, from rockets fired from Gaza. So, so tell me then, until this current confrontation, how many Israelis have been killed by these rockets from Gaza this year? Well, you know the numbers don't matter. Uh, the fact that Israel has shot down no, no, I, I, th I think the numbers, the, the numbers do Gaza. matter. Do, do you know? Do you know the answer to this? How many Israelis had died this year? No, I until really, really know current... that it doesn't matter, man. No, well, because why does it not matter? Israel, I'm I can you tell the you question. that Israel shot down hundreds of them. Each how one of those Israelis, rockets could have killed five people. How many Israelis people. were killed? No, but how many Israelis were actually killed by these rockets? Do, do you know the math? Assume that every rocket can kill five people. And there have been more than 700 that, fired since last that was week. Not, that was not the my question. The fact that Israel's okay. protecting let, let, its let citizens me, let, let me a lot give you better the than any other country is. Okay. Israel has no reason to apologize for that, the same way that England and every other country wouldn't apologize for protecting its citizens okay. well. Let, let, as, well, you're either unwilling or are unable to give the answer to that question. So let me tell you, The Economist says because it's that irrelevant, since 2004, it's well, that's, that's your view, but, but we're, well. we're trying to bring this story to our audiences around the world. Since 2004, according to The Economist, 20 Israelis were killed by rockets that came from Gaza into Israel. And this year, not one Israeli was killed by these rockets until this current confrontation began. Do you accept those figures? Michelle, I would like you to see what it's like to be stuck in a room where you can't leave with your children for hours on end, that at any given moment a siren will go off uh, that can go through your roof. Uh, the fact that Israel has managed to stop that from happening using defensive measures has prevented war, has prevented a lot of people from being killed on both sides. Or certainly you so could argue, couldn't you, that Hamas was also stopping a worse happening all of this period because although there were rockets being fired, they, they weren't the, the big rockets that have caused damage in recent days. They were mostly homemade contraptions. Because Israel, at the beginning uh, of uh, right after they killed the Egyptian, uh, right after they killed uh, Jabari, the uh, Hamas general, they went and they destroyed the long-range missiles that Hamas had. Otherwise, the damage would have been much, much more. Hamas was trying to kill civilians with every single rocket that they fired. And the fact that they didn't succeed, the fact well, that Hamas you, you'd is agree a failure that not all of them, over not the all past of them week is a very by, good thing for not both Not all of sides. them were fired by Hamas, were they? I mean, you know that, and, and I know that. Hamas was, is not the only group that's operating in Gaza. But Hamas is in charge of Gaza. Hamas overthrew the rightful Palestinian leadership there, and since then has made life a living hell for their people as well as ours. Welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, Simon, what did you make of that uh, clip there, which, which seemed a very, very hostile interview? And, and the BBC presenter there and journalist there wasn't so much interested in the facts, but really just wanted to make political capital out of the number of uh, Israelis that were killed, ignoring the fear factor involved in these missiles and ignoring the fact they actually paralysed over 1.5 million Israelis from going to, about their ordinary lives, going to schools, um, uh, kids going to schools and going to jobs and what have you. Well, I think you just said it very, well, very, very well. I mean, it's an astonishing piece of footage because Gil Hoffman, the guest there, is the political editor for the Jerusalem Post. He's not a spokesperson for the Israeli government or the IDF. He's speaking as a journalist, as an analyst of what is going on. Yet Michel Hussein, the BBC journalist there, uh, really pretty much baits him over the uh, casualty figures. Um, it's actually fairly disgusting. And also to term uh, you know, the missiles coming over as homemade rockets uh, really just uh, downplays the impact of what was going on. And I, I give credit to Gil Hoffman there for keeping his cool under what was probably a very, very trying circumstance.
And also, we, we've seen these type of interviews uh, before, um, um, particularly if I, I look at Channel 4 News with uh, Jon Snow. And uh, I remember one particular interview interviewed um, I the uh, Israeli government spokesman. Sorry, his uh, name slips my mind at the moment. It'll come back to me in a minute. But he put him under so much pressure, wouldn't even allow him to actually finish his conversation without becoming very, very aggressive. Now, you you kind of see when we see these programs uh, and we see these interviews, um, why doesn't the mainstream media, a lot of them, give Israel a fair chance to actually answer some of the questions or the accusations that are presented to Israel? Well, this is it. I don't see a lot of the Palestinian spokespeople uh, being treated the same way. They're being treated with kid gloves. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, a lot of the journalists come into these interviews trying to prove their point, their preconceived notion of uh, Israel as being in the wrong, Israel being as the, the aggressor, and putting our spokespeople on defense. Um, of course, you know, it's not easy to explain Israel's case. I said it's a complicated situation. But uh, you know, it's time that the media actually gave, gave Israel a fair chance. Yeah. And uh, also in terms of uh, false and uh, misleading uh, broadcasts or articles that are misleading or factually inaccurate, um, isn't there a great danger that some of these uh, uh, reports actually lead to an increase in anti-Semitism because of the way that Israel is being demonised through some of the mainstream media? Well, I think the statistics speak for themselves. Just in the last few weeks, we've seen uh, in Britain, certainly, I think, uh, third, third highest um, instance of anti-Semitism since uh, records began. Um, we've had a massive increase, I think, in the 50% plus region in France, also 30 something percent increase in Belgium. Um, Obviously, of course, there are you know, right-wing anti-Semites out there. Um, there always have been. Um, but we, all, we tend to see increases in anti-Semitism at times of tension in the Middle East. Uh, you know, the Jews who are living in Western countries, uh, in Europe, in Britain, America, they're not responsible for what goes on in Israel. Um, and nor should they be um, held responsible or blamed for the actions of the Israeli government uh, or their fellow co-religionists abroad. After all, um, you know, if something happens in the, I don't know, in the Catholic Church, for example, we don't see people uh, screaming abuse at um, Italians or the Vatican, for example. Um, in terms of uh, what we've been discussing so far, we've very much talked about uh, broadcast media, but um, also want to now discuss the impact of um, photojournalism, uh, in particular that uh, pictures can say a thousand words. Um, how are photographs being manipulated to put Israel in a bad light? Well, you have all sorts of uh, ways of doing this. I think just in the last few days, um, there was a, actually a very good headline in the Irish Independent, which actually stated that a, a, a rocket from Gaza had struck and ceasefire had been breached. Now, you would have expected perhaps an illustrative photograph of uh, I don't know rocket being launched or perhaps the landing site uh, near Ashkelon in the south of Israel. No, there was a photo of an Israeli soldier firing a tear gas canister. Now, that's the image that's going to stick in people's minds. It's very subliminal, but it's actually very, very effective. We also see uh, other things which people don't realize uh, going on, um, the use of uh, recycled photographs. I've seen photos of Gaza um, taken in 2009 in the, in the midst of a conflict where, of course, you see uh, scenes of destruction and uh, you know, people in a particularly bad way. And they've been republished maybe a year, year and a half later. And Gaza certainly isn't like that. Uh, you know, of course, it doesn't look good in the middle of a battle. But that's not the situation for everyday Gazans. So people tend to get the, their, their images from, from these photographs that are misleading. And even things such as the, the angles that a photographer uses to portray uh, how Palestinians are, are allegedly suffering under, uh, you know, Israeli, uh, under Isra Israeli uh, uh, military, for example. Uh, we've got a, a clip to go to now. It's an honest reporting clip uh, entitled How an Anti-Semitic uh, Picture Has Made the News. Hi, this is Yardine Frankel from Honest Reporting's Jerusalem office.
The South African Broadcast Corporation ran a story about Israeli attempts to curb illegal immigration from Africa. So what picture did they use that they thought would best illustrate this story about immigration? Check out their website. Take a closer look at that outrageous picture. It's shocking. It has nothing to do with the story. But you know what? What's even more disgusting? We saw this same picture two years ago used by the Washington Post. Here is the picture from a 2010 Washington Post photo gallery. Is it a picture of a news event or simply anti-Semitism? So where did this photo originally come from? It's a Reuters photo taken from two years ago. And the Reuters caption is that it's an activist at a protest. Here's the original picture from the Reuters website, and here's their caption. But this isn't a news photo. This is simply an anti-Semitic caricature with an anti-Israel slogan thrown on top of it that is now being used for the last two years again and again by the news. If you are outraged that a news organization would use this picture, do something about it. Contact the SABC and demand that they remove this picture and apologize for publishing it. Hello and welcome back to the uh, Middle East Report. Uh, so we've got a clip to go to in a minute and in the course of researching for this program it's a clip that uh, your organisation Honest Reporting put together shows how a, a photographer has manipulated um, the, the image he was taking of some Palestinian children putting them on a, on a fence and showing that actually these are prisoners with a, with a caption. It, it just shows you that how are so many photographers or even newspapers for carrying these pictures able to get away with this? Well, a lot of the time, you, there's a couple of different issues going on here. Um, we have Palestinian photographers on the ground, of course. Um, then you have the uh, incidents that take place yeah. that are actually caused by the media being there. Mm. For example, stoning of Israeli cars. A lot of the time, these things don't take place until there's actually a, a photojournalist there to take the photos and encourage the, uh, um, the people to start, the Palestinians to start throwing stones or attacking Israelis. Um, of course, you know, a lot of photojournalists photo like to do particularly arty type photos. And a lot of the time they don't portray Israel in a particularly good light. Um, I remember, I think, the last, the last World Cup, the uh, Football World Cup, we had scenes of uh, photographs of goalposts um, against the background of Israel's security barrier, for example. Um, you know, these are things that were quite frankly, uh, they didn't really have much to do with football at all, but uh, you know, they had a lot to do with uh, propagandizing. We've got a clip to go to now that looks at how photographs are being manipulated to convey a completely different reality that is only designed to uh, demonise Israel. Hi, this is Yardine Frankel from Honest Reporting's Jerusalem office. On June 20th, 2010, a Gaza-based freelance photographer went to an anti-Israel protest rally at an industrial area of the Gaza Strip. However, the picture that he took was not terribly exciting. It showed how few people were at this anti-Israel rally. But one thing caught his eye. Notice the gate on the right-hand side of the picture. The photographer had children stand behind that gate holding a protest sign. But even this was not terribly compelling. So then he had the children stand behind the bars and stick their arms through it, and then he took the picture from an angle. The result made it seem like these children were actually in a prison. Now in the caption that he used, he put this as a picture of a demonstration, not of a prison, but a newspaper doesn't have to use the caption that a photographer submits. So when the Independent decided to run an article about Palestinian minors who were detained by Israel, they talked about children clapped in irons, and then they ran this photo with no caption. How would anyone looking at this article know that these are not children in an Israeli prison? What's really outrageous is the Independent used this same picture two years ago, and now we find it cropping up on all sorts of articles and opinion pieces that slam Israel. Here it is in Australia's The Age. So what can you do about it? Contact the Independent at the email address on the screen or in the description and demand that they stop using these staged photos.
Welcome back to the uh, Middle East report. Uh, Simon, I, when I just uh, look at that very, very good clip, but also a very, very disturbing clip, uh, and the fact that the Independent chose to actually run with this photograph, doesn't that actually bring their own credibility as a, as a, a newspaper into dispute by actually showing pictures that are actually fake or misleading? It does, but of course it only does if someone's actually watching for these things. I mean, over the years, I've seen some incredible stuff um, I had no idea that this sort of uh, manipulation was going on until we actually um, we used we hired a former photojournalist from from London who's now living in Israel, a guy with many many years of expertise, and he actually sat th and went through hundreds and hundreds of the photographs from Reuters, the Associated Press, Getty Images, and he was able to analyse and show how these things have been manipulated, and it was a real eye opener. And uh, one thing we, we've seen um, uh, very, very recently, uh, and it's made a, quite a lot of uh, news headlines this year, has been the rise of anti-Semitic cartoons. Um, I particularly think of the uh, Gerald Scarf cartoon in the uh, Sunday Times uh, back on January, which appeared on Holocaust Memorial Day that uh, really reenacted the medieval blood libel. Um, and then we've seen another picture supplied by Honest Reporting with a with Guardian cartoon. Um, why are we starting to see cartoonists really start to portray kind of anti-Semitic caricatures of the Jewish people in Israel? Well, I don't just, don't just think it's the cartoonists, but the fact that these things are actually getting past the editors into the newspapers themselves. I think what we're seeing here is I don't believe that there's necessarily anti-Semitic intent. However, the result is... And what it means is that uh, anti-Semitic tropes are now becoming mainstream. So here we see, for example, the Gerald Scarf cartoon. Now, of course, that it was published on Holocaust Memorial Day made it doubly, doubly worse. Um, but what I would say about this is simply that, from my point of view as the managing editor of Honest Reporting, this cartoon is simply wrong any day of the week. And we would have responded whether it was on Holocaust Memorial Day or any other day because it simply portrayed Israel uh, inaccurately and offensively. But, but doesn't something like that, because, you know, I, 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 read, I read the Sunday Times and uh, get that newspaper. Now, sometimes when you're going through there, there's, there's big advertisements in the paper. Um, there's very gripping uh, photographs. But you're always then drawn to the cartoons when you get to the uh, editorial page. And isn't it that someone who's maybe not actually interested in what happens in Israel or interested in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict sees that picture and they just associates in their mind that here Israel's the aggressor, they're oppressing Palestinians, and it reinforces a lot of those lies and misinformation regarding Israel and also demonises the Israeli prime minister. And surely a picture like that should actually be made of the uh, Syrian president, Bash al-Assad. That's a good point. And those are very, very powerful images, cartoons. Um, certainly the, with the, the linkage there with blood, uh, of course, made it uh, particularly nasty. Um, and I think also editors have to realise, um, is it offensive to, the, to Jews? Forget whether, uh, whether Israelis don't like it or not, if it's a criticism of their policies. But this was offensive to the Jewish community, irrespective of whether, of whether individual Jewish people agree with Benjamin Netanyahu's policies or not. And we've got another cartoon to go to now, and this is uh, taken from The uh, Guardian. And uh, what I find disturbing about this uh, picture, Simon, is there you've got the uh, Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, saying vote Likud with the rockets in the, in the background. You've got very, very clearly what is Israeli flags made to look like rockets. And uh, there he's standing in front and he's got a puppet of uh, Tony Blair and uh, William Hague as if he's the great puppet master. Now, surely um, cartoons like this conjure up images of the uh, elders of Zion. It's actually the Jewish people controlling the world. And surely this is very insidious cartoon. It is very insidious. I mean, it's a particularly nasty trope. In that particular example, of course, the charge was that Benjamin Netanyahu had called elections uh, on the back of uh, a military campaign. Um, and of course, the Western media got it completely wrong because, in fact, uh, Netanyahu's party actually lost seats in the election as the Israeli electorate moved, from, moved to the centre rather than to the right, which was what people were expecting.
And uh, in terms of reaction, I mean, sometimes when we, we see art uh, cartoons like the um, Joe Scarf art uh, cartoon in the Sunday Times, it just creates a, a revulsion. And sometimes when we switch on our, our mainstream channels to get some news and you, you get angry because you see this misconception that, that Israel um, is portrayed in a very bad light or there's wrong information or the story doesn't have any context to it. Um, thankfully, I've got an outlet for that because I've got my program here on the Middle East Report are able to put Israel's case forward. Um, but what can some of our viewers who are very concerned about the way that Israel's treated by some of the mainstream media in this country? Well, I think the first thing to do is to um, actually make your views known, because if the media aren't criticised or critiqued, then of course they're going to continue doing this. Um, obviously, the best thing to do is educate yourself. Um, so from my point of view, uh, the best thing for your viewers to do would be to go to our website at www.honestreporting.com and subscribe. It's free and you'll get regular communiques to, in your inboxes uh, alerting you to issues of media bias and actually how you can respond, uh, giving you the information that you need. Yeah, my wife did that after the last program we did. So she uh, she subscribed and then says, oh, you've seen this, you've seen this. So it, it's very good that uh, we have uh, emails now and things can actually go viral as well. And uh, maybe we can actually hold some of our newspapers and media corporations to account pu purely because we're interested in truth. I mean, on this mm -hmm. program here, um, I would say that, that we are biased in terms of uh, Israel because we have a passion and a, uh, and a heart and a love for Israel and the Jewish people and want to con uh, convey the truth. And if you want to see uh, turn on the other mainstream channels, then you get a different perspective. But I f personally feel that Israel doesn't get that fair representation, that Israeli uh, government spokespeople don't get the chance to say what Israel's position. And the majority of the mainstream media don't really get to give their viewers the real insight into what the real Israel is like and the challenges that Israel and the Jewish people face. Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, it, in fact, we see a lot of the time that, uh, you know, when ordinary people actually come visit Israel, uh, they have a completely different view of what the country is about, um, because what you see on your media is not uh, a realistic portrayal of what Israel is. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think I think that's that's very, very important. Um, I know particularly that uh, the Jewish community are very, very concerned when they see alarming cartoons like the Gerald Scarf one in the Sunday Times also coming from such a, uh, a newspaper with so much uh, reputation and, and um, so much influence as the Sunday Times is, is certainly the best quality newspaper in this country. And certainly they have the best journalists working for them. Um, but thankfully, uh, Rupert Murdoch, the owner of News Corporation um, came out very, very quickly against this. Do you think the way the Sunday Times handled this was correct? Because having looked, having worked with many journalists, and I would have thought they would have thought, we got this cartoon, it's not particularly nice, it's controversial, but in our magazine, we did a complete expose on some of the myths and lies regarding the uh, what happened uh, during the Holocaust. Uh, and so therefore, the, maybe they thought that this was in the magazine, they could get away with it. Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's simply wrong to make any sort of uh, equivalences between uh, the use of the Holocaust and what's going on in Israel. Um, these two things are not, not intimately linked. Of course, you know, the Jewish people went through a particularly uh, appalling trauma, um, six million dead Jews and, as, as a result of uh, Nazism. But to start uh, uh, comparing Israel to uh, the Nazis is under European Union definition of anti-Semitism, it's anti-Semitic. Um, and it's no excuse to say, well, we balance things with a, a nice piece uh, about the, the Holocaust, because that doesn't make up for the fact that the particular cartoon was offensive. Um, I give credit to the Sunday Times. They held their hands up eventually. They apologized. Um, this is not something we see from every media outlet. Uh, for example, The Guardian, uh, very, very rare that The Guardian will even admit that there's a problem. Um, and in those rare times that they have admitted that there's a problem, that certain things that they've written or cartoons they've produced uh, may be perceived as anti-Semitic, um, it's carried on. Even after The Guardian has actually said we need to be more careful, it still carries on. Um, I think there's a particularly vicious streak in some of the media here, particularly in The Guardian. Yeah. I mean, I, having looked at uh, many of the uh, 
Guardian's uh, photographs, and it comes down to Israel. There's a very striking thing that appears. You often see a lot of uh, Palestinian children, or women, and uh, elderly Palestinians, but you see Israeli soldiers, but you never see their face. They very, very rarely show ordinary Israelis in their pictures, almost deliberately. Um, uh, and isn't this very worrying, just as much as a negative or false media report to actually show pictures that are misleading? Uh, isn't that also something that needs to be uh, confronted? Well, absolutely. And in terms of the dehumanisation of Israelis, I mean, for example, taking the you know is Israeli soldiers, these are a bunch of 18, 19 year old kids. Uh, they're also scared. You know, they don't want to be standing at a checkpoint. They're worried that someone's going to pull a gun or a knife on them. Um, and in the end, because uh, you know, Israel has a u universal conscription. Um, these are our kids, you know, they've been brought up in the right way. They have their own human decent values system. Uh, and we sometimes forget that, that these are not people that join the army because, you know, they have a, an urge to go around, uh, you know, shooting. These are people that are defending their, you know, their, their kids, their parents uh, and their country. Simon, we're down to less than two minutes of the program. Do you have a, a message for our viewers? you'd like to convey? The message is uh, all is not lost. Um, certainly go and subscribe to Honest Reporting and educate yourselves. And also uh, take the time to look uh, critically at your media. Um, when you read the story, when you see the headline, don't just take it for granted that what you're reading is uh, the, complete, uh, the completely accurate portrayal of Israel. Um, think for yourselves and also take action and let the media know when you think that they've got it wrong. Yeah, that's, well, thank you for that. Uh, we've got about uh, a minute left, Simon. So I want to thank you very much again for, for being my guest today on the Middle East Report and for the excellent work that you're doing through Honest Reporting in really countering the lies and the misinformation that are presented by Israel in the mainstream media and actually to provide a check and balance, which I think is very important. I think it's important to work with journalists to engage with them, but it's also important that they know that if they've produced a false report, that there are people monitoring what they're doing. Absolutely. And thank you as well for Revelation TV for giving us the opportunity to actually put our message out on air when in a lot of places we're just not able to. That's an absolute pleasure. And uh, I really want to thank you for watching today's program. We can see here in this program today, when it comes down to the mainstream media, there is a real battle. And that battle is for truth. And it's important that the truth of Israel is conveyed. And uh, thanks to Revelation TV, here on the Middle East Report, so we can actually put Israel's side of the story, which is sadly not heard in the mainstream media. So let's continue to stand with Israel. Let's continue to pray for Israel and the Jewish people that the truth of her situation will be told. And thank you for watching today's programme.